science is moving, moving very fast. And actually, we're entering a new era for science where you see discoveries that are going out of the lab at a pace which is faster than anything we have seen before in history. I think we have a team of scientists all across the world working to push the boundaries of science. And this will have strong consequences on who we are as humans, how we live together, and the future of our planet. It's just an example I want to uh, show to you before I enter into the depth of my talk is if you look what's happening around synthetic biology or gene editing, I think we have some discoveries that, are, that will give the right of new therapeutics, cure new illnesses, uh, help uh, regenerate our ecosystems, and of course will be a force for the, for the good for the future. A quick uh, example that I'd like to show, uh, the science of the extinction, the extinction. I think there is research going on by Beth Shapiro in Stanford, which is really now trying to use synthetic biology and our knowledge in gene editing to, to regenerate or to bring species uh, that were extinct back to life. The Genesis machine, I think this is other work that's being done in the US, where people are really playing with the building block of life, recreating life from scratch, and of course, as you can imagine, this will have huge consequences about how we see ourselves in the universe. Of course, this is not all good. I think we have seen uh, in the past some domains where science should, has gone probably too far. You all have heard about the CRISPR baby, where scientists in China in 2018 edited the first uh, genetic material of some twin babies. Uh, we have seen uh, the first chimeras, where scientists have uh, uh, mixed stem cells from different species. And all these experiments, of course, have uh, created a lot of discussion within the scientific community, within society, uh, about whether you know, science is not going too far. But this is not a snapshot of what's happening now in the labs worldwide. We cannot predict the future, but we can anticipate it. If you look what's happening in the horizon, what's cooking in the labs, the project on all fields of science where scientists are working on, I think this is really a call to all of us to try to look into the future and anticipate what's out in the horizon to make sure that we can make the best of those opportunities, avoid missed opportunities of science, but also mitigate the risks, just as we have seen. What we have done in the past, we have asked a collective of 500 scientists all across the world, and we, we came with a simple question. How can we anticipate what's happening in your field? What's on the horizon that will have a strong impact on us as humans and how we live together and our relation to the planet? One of the examples that we have was in neurosciences, where, powered by the advances in computing, in neurosciences, our understanding of the brain is, is accelerating rapidly. We do not only know how the brain works, we can act upon it. And what those scientists have told us, that by 25 years, I think we'll be able not only to, uh, to monitor and record memories, to understand how memories and emotions are formed in the brain, but you can also act and control patterns of memories and emotions. And it doesn't require a lot of thinking or imagination to, uh, to think about, again, the positive of those advances, but also the scary part of it. Artificial intelligence, we, we have asked the same questions to people you know, working in Google, Apple, in academia about the future of artificial intelligence. And of course, here we see a lot of projects, a lot of research that indicates that artificial intelligence will augment human capability, capabilities, human thinking, cognition, and other functions, but to also bring new insights into human consciousness and maybe unlocking the key about who we are as humans and uh, what's the essence of life. Aging. There is a lot of investments today on the science of aging, and we see the first results uh, already coming out of, of the labs today, the first products are on the market, and the scientists tell us that by 25 years, a limited age research will be possible. What are the consequences of that? You know, what are the costs? What are the access questions to these technologies? What are the ethics of those advances? And how will our society look like when you have people that have access to these kind of advances and others don't? All unresolved questions. Something that I like as well, you know, space, space activities. Uh, there is a lot of investments, uh, companies, startups, 
uh, but also the space agencies worldwide are trying to capture asteroids and uh, try to exploit resources, rare minerals that are those asteroids, asteroids and bring them back to us. And of course, this has uh, a lot of consequences about our relation to our planet and how do we deal with our planetary resources here on Earth. I could go on and on and on, um, and I wanted to show here as well that is not only the technological uh, innovation that we, that, we, that we face, but also the way we approach traditional fields such as international relations, the practice of diplomacy, negotiations. Uh, about 25 years here, our scientists tell that computational diplomacy, so using AI, machine learning, computing uh, technologies, will reshape the way we need to think international relations and engage into those processes. I could go on and on and on, but what I wanted to tell you is, is if you see what's on the pipeline, uh, we really need to think about who are we as humans? What does that mean? You know, if we can edit our biological material, if we can act upon our thoughts, how do we perceive ourselves as humans? And what can we do? How are we going to live together? If you think about those technologies, I mentioned aging, but uh, there's a range, a range, a range of innovations that will come out of the lab in 25 years down the road that will reshape the way we live together as a society. And this has an influence about uh, the governance mechanisms that you need to set, on, set into, into place, the, the, the contract between generations. How will we relate to our planet? There is the quest for resources, there are green technologies being worked on, but what does that mean in our relations to nature? All these questions bring us to that. We cannot predict the future, but we really need to anticipate it. I think we need to think together, bring together philosophers, scientists, engineers, companies, citizens, you, all of us, to really to try to think and anticipate what those discoveries mean for us as a collective society. I think the time, this is a call to all of you to, uh, to to think now and to prepare yourself now, because we know that these advances are in the pipeline and will happen uh, 10 to 25 years down the road. We need to anticipate as well to make sure not only to prepare for those advances, but also to avoid missed opportunities for these advances, because some of these breakthroughs um, will, will help us solve of our, some of our main challenges, but we need to be ready and we need to accelerate the process if this is a good way to go. We need to anticipate also to make sure that everybody has a voice at the table. And this is also a call again to all of you that listen to this talk today, that we, that we discuss and set up the right governance mechanism, the right structure in society to make sure uh, that we can develop those technologies for the common good. So let us, let us come all together and build our collective future. Thank you. <laughs>